Okay, so <clears throat> just like there were uh, frictions on the employee side, there's also going to be frictions on the uh, employer side. Okay, so like in the case of employees, we have uh, frictions in the labor market on the employer side, right? And a simplistic view is uh, that the cost of hiring an additional worker is just the wage that the additional worker is paid. But it turns out this isn't really the only cost. There's actually uh, more costs to this than just that, okay? So uh, one of these are what we can call uh, labor investments. Right, so labor investments, right? Uh, the firm or any business that hires you has to incur, you know, certain costs in order to just find an employee uh, to fill a vacancy. So when they when they discover that they want to hire another worker, they're going to have to advertise the position, which means they have to create a job description and post it somewhere where people will see it, uh, like Monster.com and all these other websites, right? They then have to screen the applicants, which means that they have to read through resumes and cover letters, right? So this is why, by the way, um, people who help you like write your resume, they say, you know, make sure you spell everything correctly on your resume, right? Uh, because here, if you're, it, it's costly to the employee, or I'm sorry, the employer, right, to read resumes, right? You might send in one resume to an employer, but they might get a thousand applications, right? And so if you've got something that was spelled wrong, well, it goes in the trash, right? Done. You know, I, I they don't have time to be thorough on every single one, right? <clears throat> so once they've once they've gone through the resumes and selected, you know, candidates that they want to uh, consider, you know, continue considering, they have to do interviews, right? Which means that the interviewer, the person doing the interviewing, has to not be working for a little while, right? They have to actually like take time out of their workday and do the interview, right? If the employee or the potential employee is like someone who's very uh, sought after, like really, you know, fancy and important, right? They might have to take the candidates out to dinner and, and wine and dine them a little bit, right? And so to think about this, uh, think about the case of hiring, you know, low skill labor, right? That turns out this costs 22 hours of, of labor hours. Right, just the process of going through applications, and going through uh, employment history, and calling references, and all that. Just doing that to find just one more worker for a low-skilled work job or an entry-level job takes 22 hours of work on the part of the firm. Now, this could be split up. You know, it could be you know two people working 11 hours, right? Or it could be you know one person or four people working four or five hours and one person working two hours, right? But the point is 22 hours of productivity that could have been used for productive activities are instead spent looking for a new worker, right? And so that's like a huge cost, right? And then there's another added cost of, of potentially uh, terminating an employer or an employee, right? So should the circumstances arise that an employee must be let go or fired, there may be certain costs of actually doing so, right? Some places require severance pay, uh, and, sev and having the requirement of severance pay only makes it more costly to fire someone. Right? And so while a simplistic analysis would say, okay, well, the cost of firing people has gone up, and so therefore we should see less firing, right? what we could also see is employers spending more time screening employees or looking at them more carefully so as to hopefully avoid having to fire the worker in the future. And so we might see reduced hiring as a result of higher termination costs. Right? Now, once the worker is hired and begins actually coming to work, there's also uh, you know training programs, right? So we have to do uh, employee training, right? And these can be formal or informal, right? 
uh, and we also and within these we have you know what we call uh, explicit costs and implicit costs okay an explicit cost would be the cost of hiring people specifically to train new employees and the materials necessary to do so so these are you know uh, people or workers uh, hired specifically to train new people or new employees right or they're the resources bought uh, that are only used Uh, for training. Okay, so anything that that is used specifically for 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 training new people, right? These are workers that aren't necessarily adding productive. They're not adding production to the to the company. They're adding instruction, right? So think about you know like HR departments, right? HR departments are typically an explicit cost of employee training, right? They only exist for the most part. So I'm overgeneralizing, I know. So don't don't send me emails saying that I'm missing something. I agree, I'm overgeneralizing here. But HR departments generally only exist to basically help train new workers or to help answer questions about uh, conditions of of work, right? They're not there actually like producing things. They're not so the HR department at Ford is not on the assembly line making cars, right? They're there to handle disputes and to help uh, facilitate training people. And implicit costs, uh, these are, are typically what we could call like opportunity costs of uh, of of various people <clears throat> of people or equipment that is uh, used temporarily temporarily close enough uh, for training I'm an economist not an English major if I spell a word wrong sue me temporarily close enough right <clears throat> and so let's think about this uh, in in you know uh, the real world. So one example of this would be like an experienced worker who job shadows or oversees the new worker. Right, so how many, uh, if you've ever been a server at a restaurant, right, your first couple days on the job were probably spent uh, going around the restaurant with someone who had been there for a long time or for longer than you, uh, making sure that you were doing things correctly, right? So you had someone with experience who was basically watching you, standing over your shoulder, making sure that you were doing everything correct. That person could have been actually working instead. So their actual productivity is reduced because they are spending their time training you instead of working. Okay, so explicit costs are people who only exist to train new people. Implicit costs are like the opportunity costs of workers who are tasked with training instead of working. Okay, uh, another uh, so, so you know, at Ferris, let's say, uh, I, I get observed by my faculty members, right, it's by my, my peers, right, and, <clears throat> and what they do is they come into the classroom and they observe me, right. Uh, right now, one of, our, one of the other professors in the econ department uh, is observing this class, right, so if he sees this, you know, hi, how are you, hope you're doing well. Um, so, so he faces an opportunity cost, right. Because he is observing me and making sure that he's doing that I'm doing my job, he is taking time away from doing his own job, right? And as a result, 
he is, is less productive, but he's more instructive to me, right? And so that wouldn't be an explicit cost. That's an implicit cost because he's giving up his time that could be used being productive, okay? Um, but there's other implicit costs, right? Uh, we, we have uh, even the employees, the new employees, uh, have an opportunity cost. Okay? Because presumably, if they're sitting in training, so if they're sitting in a training seminar, they're not actually doing anything productive for the company. Right? They're not actually producing anything. They're learning how to produce. Okay? So, but even, even if they didn't learn how to produce, surely they could have done something productive with their time. Right? They could have done something. You know, maybe just like maybe as something as simple as grabbing everyone in the office coffee. Right? That would be more productive than sitting in a meeting about how to be productive. Does that kind of make sense? So doing something would be more productive than just sitting down. So here's sort of an example of this, right? So when I got hired here, I had to go through a uh, new employee orientation, right? And there were some tremendous, there were some very important things that I learned uh, during that week-long uh, series of, of talks, right? There were some things that were very, very valuable, right? Uh, but as, you know, as a person who grew up with the internet, you know, I'm very familiar with how to use uh, email, right? I know how to do that. I know how to set up the computer. I know how to change the background and change the settings and all that stuff, right? I know how to save files. I know how to attach them to, to documents or emails and everything, right? I know how to work a computer. Well, turns out I had to spend a whole day uh, at this orientation thing learning about how the computer works, right? That was a day that, frankly, I could have been working on other things, right? I could have done something much more productive than sit in that room learning about how Outlook works, right? But instead, I had to go and learn uh, how to use email, right? And fortunately, uh, I still remember, I still somehow retained that knowledge, okay? So, you know, we can have uh, productive meetings where people learn new skills that are important and we can have unproductive meetings, right? And so even there, right, in new employees also must have an opportunity cost, 